And Mayor Pete Buttigieg, welcome back to The Issue Is. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. So uh, this week you were in San Francisco uh, joining protesters for what's called AB6, which is a bill that would help turn Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, and other people like that, hundreds of thousands of potential California employees, into employees and not gig economy workers. The pushback on that is people like Uber and Lyft the way that they are. They save a lot of money, and consumers are worried that could make that whole thing a whole lot more expensive to the consumer. What do you say to that? Look, I, I think it's a great technology with great potential, but if the only way we're making uh, rides more affordable and accessible is by making other people miserable, namely drivers, then something's wrong. Look, it should be possible to have a thriving business in this industry and also do right by your workers. Mm -hmm. But what we see now is at the very moment when the gig economy is getting bigger and bigger, be the gig economy is becoming a more and more significant part of how our country works. We're also seeing indications that it could create a kind of underclass of workers who aren't really treated as workers. And these companies can't have it both ways. They can't say, you need to support us because we're creating so many jobs. And then say, well, this isn't really a job, it's just a gig, and so we don't have to take care of workers or treat them the same. But are you worried about the, the economic fallout that could, could have happened to that? Could that lead to more automation? Well, I think uh, we're still a ways away from automated vehicles, but when they come, I don't think uh, uh, we're going to stave them off very long by mistreating workers. Look, in this country, we believe that when you work for a living, you ought to be able to expect certain basic protections around your wages, around your benefits. Uh, if our economy can't deliver that, what's the point of an economy? We should and must deliver a successful life for people who work full time. It, it, the longer we live in a country, where you can work full-time and be poor. And, and, and I, when I say full-time, I'm including those who string together a gig with a couple of part-time jobs who mm -hmm. are working well over 40 hours a week. As long as that's the case, something is deeply wrong in our economy. But speaking of that sort of automated picture, because I know you're the millennial mayor, you like to talk about, I'm not just looking four years down the road, I'm looking yeah. 40, 50 years down the road. Um, you know, the number one job for white men in this country right now is truck drivers. Right. Um, if all of a sudden all those trucks become automated and you don't need truck drivers, you don't need Uber drivers, you don't need Lyft drivers, right. what does our country do? What's your answer to that as, as president? Yeah, this is a very serious issue. In fact, I'm chairing a group of mayors looking at how automation changes our jobs as mayors. It's definitely changing uh, the workforce, it's changing the economy, and we need to make sure people are equipped with the kind of skills to get ahead in a world where from now on, we may just be changing jobs or even changing careers mm -hmm. far more often than previous generations did. Now, that could actually be perfectly fine mm -hmm. as long as it's in a context where you know, even as your jobs change, that you can get good health care, that you can get retirement savings, you can get health benefits. We just can't go on like this, organizing our economic life around the idea that most people will have a single relationship that lasts a lifetime with a single employer because that's not the future. Mm -hmm. Another big issue this week is emergency response. Uh, we see a pen another potential hurricane moving uh, in this country right now. The president today tweeting out that he is the best thing that's ever happened to Puerto Rico. I mean, it's, response. it's typical. He's talking about himself when he should be talking about how to secure the people of Puerto Rico. The attack on the mayor makes no sense at a moment when the president should be rallying the country behind a response that will help those in danger. And I'm particularly disturbed to see this is happening at a time when funding is actually being diverted out of FEMA in order to be sent to enforce this administration's inhumane border policy. This is a moment when we need more not less by way of resources going into our emergency management capabilities as a country. Not to mention the fact that these emergencies are going to become more frequent and more severe as a consequence of climate change that this president won't even admit is real. Yeah, and that's some $271 million being moved out of FEMA to potentially build the president's border wall. That's right, and yeah. divert, why, why in the world would we be diverting money away from emergency management at a moment when emergencies are happening more and more often. This is a classic example of what you have when the White House is prioritizing its politics over our safety and lives are on the line. And on that, that topic of climate change, the Amazon is burning right now, right now. <clears throat> right. If you're president and you see that happening, it's not in our country, right. how do you respond? You coordinate the leaders of the world to make sure that there is support and if necessary pressure 
on the government of Brazil to make sure they're doing the right thing. Look, this isn't just a natural disaster that couldn't have been avoided. This is connected to an aggressive campaign of deforestation by the Brazilian leader that has largely been encouraged or green-lighted by the American president. And you saw at the G7, most of the leaders of the world coming to the table to talk about these problems, and American leadership largely absent. When he was in the room, they were pretty much patting him on the head not to hurt his feelings, and he was not in the room during some of the most important conversations. The world needs American leadership, whether it's responding to a crisis in one country that affects all of us, like the Amazon fires, mm -hmm. or whether it's dealing with issues like democracy, human rights, climate change. The world needs America, but it can't be just any America. It has to be an America that's actually living out our values. But I mean, what specifically can you do, though? Well, we could, we could direct aid in yeah. order to make sure in the short term that there are resources to contain the fire. We could even use our military assets to help. But more for the long run, mm. we should make sure we're creating the right kind of pressure so that less deforestation, including deforestation by burning, is taking place in the first place. You know, there's a lot of evidence that right now it's U.S. trade policies and other policies that have encouraged Brazil to move in this direction, which is harmful for the entire world. Well, let's talk for a moment about education because kids are going back to school, kids are going back to college right now as well. Um, where do you see the role of the federal government when it comes to education? Because there's a lot of people that think education is best served when it's done really, really localized and that the federal government shouldn't be that involved in it. What do well, you say? As a mayor, I'm a big fan of empowering yeah. local officials, but we need to do more with national resources to mm -hmm. support them. You know, in most countries, if you have an area where there are students who are more in need, more low income, and need better support, you're going to spend more per pupil on those students. This is one of the few places in the world where you spend less. Mm -hmm. We need to do more to increase teacher pay, especially in Title I schools where we know having the strongest teachers would make the biggest difference in the lives of vulnerable kids. And we need to make sure that our K-12 system is prepared for a future where automation is going to change how we relate to the workforce. And it's not going to be enough just to teach uh, knowledge. Knowledge is at your fingertips. We've got to teach critical thinking. We've got to teach social and emotional learning. And while we're at it, if we really want to deliver results in K-12 through schools where uh, so many kids are so vulnerable, we've got to talk about mental health as part of the solution in our schools and make it as easy to get psychological and emotional support as it is to get a school nurse. But would you, like Kamala Harris is talking about sort of a mandate to increase teacher pay around the country, do you support something like that? I would use federal funds for teacher pay and we would invite districts to accept a package that would go to teacher pay and also include some uh, means to support professional development. Look, we have a system, for better or for worse, that relies a lot on local systems, local districts, local leadership. That's fine, as long as we're putting the resources into it. But right now, we have a U.S. Secretary of Education who doesn't even believe in public education. Mm. And that is going to cost us in the long run, at a time when education is the foundation of U.S. competitiveness and success for the future. I know one of the things you were talking about at your event in Hollywood this week uh, was the idea that kids going to school are also worried now about gun violence, which is something that they should never have to think about going to school. That's right. Um, there's a lot of plans that are out there, some saying assault weapons ban, some saying we should do a mandatory gun buyback, which is what Beto O'Rourke is saying, probably the most uh, extreme out there. What do you think? As somebody from the middle of the country who ha knows people that have a lot of guns, yeah. who grew up you know, as part of the military, where do you see this? Well, the remarkable thing is the majority of not just Americans, but of Republicans and of gun owners support common sense gun safety measures. That's universal background checks, that's red flag laws mm -hmm. to identify people who could be a danger and to disarm hate. It's making sure that we're actually researching the effects of gun violence, which is right now banned by Congress. Think about what that means. If they're banning research on a subject, it begs the question of what it is they don't want us to find out. And we need to face the fact that the kinds of weapons that I trained on or uh, carried and saw in Afghanistan have no business in American communities, which is why we need to end the sale of assault rifles. But this is not only a question of gun safety policy. We also need more funds for countering violent extremism, especially as we see a rise of white nationalist violence in this country. And my action plan on gun safety also calls for us to take more steps to build up our civic and political power. Because if 94% of Americans want something, which is the case of background checks, mm -hmm. and it's still not happening in Washington, even though it doesn't even cost that much money, that raises more fundamental questions about our democracy and why it is not responding to a clearly 
expressed will of the American people. Some have argued the filibuster itself is not democratic. Uh, I think the filibuster's days need to end. Look, the filibuster already has a very mixed history, including uh, some very problematic uses to get in the way of civil rights. And in the hands of Senate Republicans, it will continue to be a way to prevent progress from happening when the American people are demanding that we do something on everything from election security to gun safety to climate change to wages to democracy itself. You know, the counter to that, though, then what happens if Republicans are in charge and they ram a bunch of stuff through that you disagree with and you can't stop it? Well, the good news is uh, right now Republicans don't just, in the Senate and Congress, don't just agree with me. They disagree with the American people. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that there are political consequences for standing in the way of what the American people demand. Now, I believe with that in mind, we can take back the Senate into democratic hands. But I also believe that uh, when there's a senator who is reelected, who's standing in the way of good policy, we can create pressure. And one of the best uses of Air Force One during my presidency will be to fly it into the district or state of a member of Congress or the Senate who is defying the American people on good, needed, important policy just so they can cater to special interests and hold them accountable for that in front of their own people. Uh, let's talk for a moment about the, sort of where the race is at. Uh, we've got the debates coming up. It's going to be a much shrunken field for mm -hmm. the next debate. Um, our focus groups in the past have given you really high marks, but your poll numbers have been pretty consistent, kind of stuck in the same place for a long time now. What's your strategy going into this next debate? How do you sort of kickstart up into the even next level? Well, we'll continue to make sure that our message around American values is clear and that there's a, a greater sense of what it is we're going to do. We started by laying out the values. Now I'm laying out more and more of the policies on everything from mental health and addiction to building up rural economies to what we're going to do specifically about climate change. And I think that presents more of an opportunity for people to understand the differences between me and my competitors because I do have a different approach from those who are to my left, who I think run the risk of further polarizing this country, and uh, those who uh, seem to believe that we can win over Republicans by sounding like Republicans. I I'm looking at a different way, and I think that will continue to come across. But we're also seeing as a matter of the political strategy that the majority probably, or at least a very healthy chunk of voters, will make up their minds in the last 10 days or so of this campaign, in January, February, on into the spring. Between now and then is making sure they know exactly where we stand and building up our ground game, which is not as glamorous as what goes on in TV, but is vitally important, and it's why we're growing our team uh, to have uh, uh, ultimately hundreds of organizers, especially across the early states. Does it sound like you're, you think it's too early to start attacking people? Well, uh, look, I I'm going to draw contrasts between yeah. me and others I don't agree with, but this idea that Democrats should be just be knifing each other in, in order to get attention, I, I think is a real disservice to the party. You know, uh, our ultimate competition is the sitting president. And uh, uh, while it, it is certainly fair game for us to talk about our differences, let's make sure that we're also building up a message that we can all rally around because the 23 or four people who wind up not getting the nomination need to be ready to rally around the one person who does so that we can go out and win. Okay, I know uh, we don't have forever, so I'm going to do something really quick. This is a 30-second little game we do called oh. Personal Issues, okay. uh, which is uh, fun stuff about you to get to know you a little bit better, oh. okay? All right. So, uh, rapid fire. Uh, your favorite movie? Oh, I don't have one favorite movie. I've been thinking about Dr. Strangelove a lot lately. Okay. Your favorite snack on the road? Uh, beef jerky. Favorite athlete? Mm, Michael Jordan. First concert you went to? I think it was a Dave Matthews show in South Bend. All right, DMB. Last book you read? Um, oh, uh, I'm in the middle of a, uh, I've been reading a book called uh, Ill Fares the Land. It's about, um, well, it's about how America and the world got to where we are. It's by a historian named Tony Judd. It was written 10 years ago, and it almost predicts where we are right now. It's wow. a good read. Last two. Favorite band? Um, I've been reconnecting with Radiohead lately. It's, All uh, right. One of my favorites. And who's your role model, finally? Mm, Abraham Lincoln. And last question, I know I saw that this is the anniversary of your first date yes. with uh, Chaston. Um, I, I was listening to a podcast recently that my friend uh, Lewis Howes did with Marianne Williamson where she mm -hmm. talked about how hard it is being single um, <laughs> in doing this yeah. and the, the value of having a partner in this. She felt like it would be more helpful here than any other aspect of her life. Interesting. What is sort of Chaston's value to you? How has he changed you? How has his involvement helped steer this campaign? Well, I think when you're uh, experiencing the just the the madness of the campaign trail having somebody in your life your life who cares about you for you and would care about you just the same 
uh, if uh, overnight you were no longer involved in politics. I think it keeps your feet on the ground. It keeps you in touch with your own values. And you need somebody who's able to say, hey, this didn't really sound like or feel like you. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can lose yourself. Uh, when I was single involved in politics, I had a hard time picturing how people who were married do it because it, it, it puts enormous pressure on your schedule and on your, on your life. Um, but now that I am, uh, I have to say I can't imagine doing this without Chastity. All right. Mayor Pete Buttigieg, thank you so much for the time. Really Thanks. appreciate it.